All right. Hello, hello. Yes, hello, everyone. You're still here. Wow, that's great. Um, I'll try to keep it a bit informal because it's like the end of the day and, you know, we're all a bit tired. And to be honest, I'm a bit tired too as well. So we'll just, you know, try to keep it informal and just sort of go through it. So what I'm going to talk about today is applying the programmer mindset throughout your game studio. Um, so um, first of all, welcome. My name is Rul Eisendam and I work for a game studio called Rage Squid and I'm one of the founders of this uh, game studio and we're with three to five people, like I'm one of the three uh, original founders and, and my task is sort of programming and, uh, and, and game design and the, the thing I want to talk about is when you're working in a small team you tend to have to work on various uh, topics. So if you're in a big team, you, you tend to work very specialized on, on a single topic and go really deep. But in a small team, stuff like marketing or, or business or like you have to take care of many things and you have to be smart about it. Uh, so what I would like to show you is the way uh, I solved a bunch of problems in the studio being a, a programmer by, by nature. So even though I do game design or, or I also help out with marketing, I'm a programmer by nature. So uh, I hope to sort of show you a couple of examples that I really thought were, you know, kind of cool and maybe it'll inspire you like, oh, hey, this is an interesting way to use your, your programmer brain. And um, so just a quick introduction. This is our, the first game we made. It's called Action Hank. And it's about an action figure in the midlife crisis. And I'll show you a little trailer in a bit so you sort of know the context of what I'm talking about. And we are currently working on our second game called uh, Descenders, uh, which is sort of a procedural almost a r sort of roguelike kind of uh, downhill mountain biking game where we sort of proceed to generate levels and there's this sort of uh, trying to manage risk and reward. So before I'm talking about the programmer mindset, I'll quickly show you uh, the, the launch trailer for Action Hank. Um, let's see. All right, so that's Action Hank, uh, and that's sort of uh, one of the games I'll be talking about. Like that's, you know, we finished this game, so that's where most of my examples have been used uh, on. So like I said, I'm going to talk about the programmer mindset, which is trying to solve problems uh, rather than leaving them to, to chance. And so the first topic I'm going to talk about is game design. And as you could see, like Action Inc. is sort of a, a speed-running, platformer, kind of physics-based kind of game. And because of that, using formulas to calculate motion made me able to, to tune the, the game design much better. So the thing is, physics-based motion feels very intuitive because that's how the real world works. If I throw something in the air, you expect it to move a certain way. So trying to use some kind of physics-based system um, for, for your, your, your game uh, motion tends to feel really nice. Uh, and what we, we, use, uh, we use Unity for our games. So we basically use a Unity rigid body and that's using uh, Euler integration, which is a very basic way uh, of moving objects. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a bit how it works. But the problem is how do you tweak this as a designer? And if you have any experience with making games or like trying to make physics-based motion, s things tend to start like swaying around a lot because it's sort of you can only sort of accelerate them. You can't really control the velocity directly. So because you can only 
uh, tune the acceleration of friction, it's really hard to, as a designer, tune uh, the physics of your game. So, so here's basically the formula for, uh, for Euler integration, or this is at least how Unity does it, or uh, like under the hood, what happens. So the velocity gets added to the position, the acceleration gets added to the velocity, and then the friction basically uh, removes the velocity as a, a multiply, uh, multiplied by the velocity itself, which means the faster you go, the more friction you have. Kind of like when you, when you drop out of an airplane, there's a moment where you stop falling because the friction catches up with the acceleration. So the thing is, how do you control this as a, as a designer? Because there's all this mathematics going on and you can only control acceleration and friction. So the programmer in me was like, hey, maybe I can do something with this. Maybe I can calculate something. And I, I figured out, like as a designer, you just want to control like how fast does it go and how fast does it sort of accelerate towards this goal. But how do you, how do you calculate the, the speed of an object based on these formulas if you can only input uh, acceleration and friction? So here's a little trick. The top speed of the object is the acceleration divided by the friction. And it's really, it's like weirdly simple, but once you start using it, it's really, it actually works. So using, you can only, as a designer, you can only enter these two values and you're like, oh, I want it to go about well, 50 kilometers an hour. Well, then you can actually tune these two values to, to sort of get this speed that you want it. And there's this other formula, which is basically the time it takes to accelerate towards this top speed, which is approximately 2 divided by the friction. So there's a funny thing here that you, you can already notice that the, the acceleration value doesn't influence the time it takes to reach the top speed. So these are some tricks that you can use as a programmer to sort of uh, become a designer for this physics-based motion. And another problem we had was tweaking the jump height uh, because, again, the game is all physics-based. So when you jump, you, uh, you apply a vertical force instead of setting the force because here's the thing if you if you if if action hank is going through this sort of like uh you know this this track and and at the end of a curve you jump if you would say hey when you jump set the upwards velocity to to 20 or something then all this upward momentum you'd lose is because you for you you hard code the velocity and that was the whole idea of the game to never hard code these things and only influence the velocity using you know acceleration um so then you say something like, um, so yeah, then I got some unexpected results. Because here's the, here's the thing. So basically what this, what this graph represents is when you apply a certain vertical velocity, this is how high your character is going to go. And I'm not sure if you can read it actually, but the idea is that if you would apply like 20 velocity, so you accelerate by 20, then you would reach like 3.5 units of height. Uh, but and if you accelerate by 40, this is how much you would, would reach. But there's a problem here because this, this, gr this is actually an exponential graph. So if you just stand on the ground and you have zero vertical speed and you apply some vertical velocity, then this is how high you're going to get. But what if, like I said, you're already on your way in this, this arc and you jump at the end, this same 20 uh, units of acceleration, which is from 40 to 60, all of a sudden give you a much bigger height increase, which is really weird, but once you start sort of calculating it, then it actually makes sense. So this is also one of those things where um, if I wasn't a programmer, I would never be able to understand this concept and sort of control it because by mapping it out and by trying to map, like figure out the mathematics behind it, I could basically reverse this process and say like, well, I'm, gonna to, I'm going to diminish the jump force exponentially based on the velocity you already have to sort of counter this problem because I want the jump to sort of always give you the same height increase. So again, this is one of those things where you as a, as a programmer can really take control of, of such like, complicated physics things and use that to just create fun game design because in the end game design is all about creating choices for the player, right? Sort of uh, making sure that the player can make interesting choices. That's what makes a good game. So moving on to the topic of uh, level design, there's this other tool that I built, uh, which I called the Player Predictor, and it's, it was for Action Hank uh, level design. And what the idea was, I could preview the physics by simulating it in the editor. And this is what that looks like. So here's a, here's a track in Action Hank, and, uh, and there's this prediction object over here. And what you can basically do is 
it can simulate a couple of seconds of physics in the editor and show me the path that the player will take based on certain inputs and velocities and that kind of stuff. So rather than me having to go into the level a million times trying to see if this jump is possible or how far the player will go, I can preview it while I'm building the level. And there's one little problem with this. Because Action Egg is such a physics-based game, um, a very good player might have a very different speed from a bad player. So you have this, you have this big run-up and, uh, and a good player knows that, that you, should, uh, you should slide downwards and you just jump at the end. But a bad player might not know that. So how do you tweak the, the jumps based on these different players? So I, again, I use this object and I basically said, well, here's, here's a set of inputs that you're doing uh, in the ideal case. So you try to slide there, you try to run here and jump at the end. And then now simulate 300 players doing this jump with various differences in their timing or you know, just forgetting inputs or not knowing that they need to, uh, to jump, for example. And then this is what you get, which is really, I think it's super cool to see. So you just have all these arcs of different types of players. And, and at the bottom here is, is the sort of the worst players. And they don't know they need to jump or slide. Or, and these are the very best players. Um, so you can see sort of what players will do regardless of their skill level. You can see all the options. And what's so interesting is you can see very clear gaps where players almost never will land. So regardless of their skill, they will never land in these, uh, in these in-between parts. So what you can then do as a designer, you can put some blocks in there. So you create this path for, for good players that rewards them for taking you know, uh, the best path. Uh, but this way you catch all the different types of players and because of that, they will always feel like they landed perfectly and, and the chances of them hitting this block is minimized. Um, and that's really nice because the idea of this is that the better player will have a better time uh, anyways, right? So Action Inc. is a, a time-based, like a racing game basically. So the better player will have a better time anyway, but this way, players that, that are less good still feel like they're doing a great job. Because if you go in here, you still land nicely into this curve. And you're like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm great at this game. So, And the first levels of Action Inc. are all built like, like this, in, in such a way that regardless of player skills, it really, like, it doesn't matter what you do, the game will always cater for you and be like, oh, yeah, no, we, we specifically put this ramp here. Um, so, and that's great if the player doesn't know that it's all sort of being controlled behind the scenes. So again, this is one of those cases where I feel really strongly that as a programmer, trying to solve this problem, m you know, created, uh, this saved basically hours and hours and hours of testing, because if you would have to go in and test every little jump that you do, it takes so much time and you have to sort of pretend to be a bad player, which is really hard if you're getting good at your own game, right? So this way you can just sort of map out the entire space of possibilities and just sort of change your level design uh, accordingly. And when you get to the harder levels, whoa, hello. When you get to the harder levels, you can basically say, well, I want the players to be really good, so I want them to, to reach this part. So I'll actually turn this into lava. So if, if they get here, then they won't make it. So, so you have a really easy way to determine, like, if I, if I only put the landing here, then I know that this is going to be a very hard jump because I know that the room for error is very minimal. So um, on to the Descenders level design. And for that, I would also like to show you a quick uh, trailer of, uh, of Descenders, which is, like I said, our new uh, game. Um, so let me load that up real quick.
Yeah, so that's uh, that's the senders. Uh, let's go back to the presentation. Um, so yeah, uh, everything you saw in the trailer was all procedurally generated. Uh, so this was a very interesting challenge. So how do we do procedural mountain bike uh, track generation? And again, this was a this was a problem I was super hyped about as a programmer, combining these design and, and, and programmer skills, because basically the idea is that you try to, uh, you teach this algorithm how to design a track. So I would try to imagine how I, as a designer, would design a mountain bike track from start to finish, and the, the steps that I would take, like, oh, you know, it needs to be a certain steepness, it needs to have this, these kinds of challenges on the track, the track needs to sort of follow these rules about steepness and curves and that kind of stuff. And then the idea is to try and teach that to the computer. Um, so the shaping of the terrain, the, the path going down, the, the what's there's this bug. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, placing the stunts and, uh, and placing the foliage basically all um, needed to be done by an algorithm. So I'll, I'll sort of try to take you through uh, a, a level being designed in, uh, in the senders from, uh, from start to finish. So you start with this sort of basic terrain shaping and for that we use basic noise functions which is you know it just creates this general shape of the terrain and I'll add a, a texture to it which then you see the, 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 the structure a bit better so stuff like you know applying textures based on steepness so the steeper parts get more like a, a rock texture so now you see you have this sort of basic uh, we're trying to go for sort of a Scottish Highlands kind of kind of terrain and then the idea is we have this terrain, and now we're going to try to find a path from the start to the finish. And for that, we actually use a very uh, common uh, tool, which is the A-star uh, pathfinding algorithm. And what it does, it basically tries to generate a path from start to finish using a rule set that I provide as a programmer and a designer. So the idea is that, basically the idea of, of pathfinding uh, with A-star is that you, ha you have to determine for every node that you can travel towards, you have to say how much it will cost to uh, to go there. So what you then do is you say uh, paths that are steeper they actually cost more or or uh, very high. <laughs> sorry, sorry, this is really distracting me. All right, I'll pretend that it's not there. Um, so so what you do is it's basically it's, it you provide these rules and you say like oh well it sh the, the path shouldn't be too curvy because then it's impossible to ride them and the path shouldn't be too steep or uh, if you specifically want them to be steep that's also possible right um, so you can basically choose as a designer what kind of track you want and then the, the pathfinding algorithm will figure it out what the, the optimal solution is based on your rules. So it's a really interesting way because you give the, the, the Pathfinder a level and it will tell you the best way to, uh, to do that according to your rules. So, um, so here we have this path uh, laid out so we can basically you know, apply a texture on the path and we can sort of shape the terrain around the path a bit. Um, and then we want to place some stunts on the track. So what we do is we gather all kinds of information about the track. and. Yeah, I think you can read it like that. So, so the idea is at every point on the track, we, we determine the slope and we determine the curvature and that kind of stuff. But we also try to make a prediction of the velocity of the player. So that's basically, we, we sort of send a fake player. Again, it's, it's, it's a bit similar to what I did with Action Hank. You, you sort of ha have a fake player and you send it around the track and you try to say like, well, this is what the physics would do. And this is, you know, going through a corner would probably make a player slow down. So you try to predict the velocity of a player, and then you have all this information about velocities and, and curvature and that kind of stuff. And then you try to place sort of pre-made stunts on the track based on these values that you know. So this is what one of them looks like, and I don't, I don't think you can read it, but... So the idea is that you provide information about the shape of the, of the stunt object, uh, the objects that you want to spawn. So for example, this thing has some flags here and it has a, like a, a launch ramp. But you also have to provide the prerequis prerequisites for the jump to be placed uh, in the first place. Because this jump has a certain distance and you don't want players that go way too fast or way too slow to, to get to that jump. So basically by predicting the, what a player will do on this track. You can place the jumps based on the velocities and the curvature and that kind of stuff. So you again, you have to design sort of 
what the ideal situation for a jump is and you and you provided some leeway and then again the algorithm will start placing it on the track and like oh hey this jump fits perfectly over there this jump fits perfectly over here and then i will just sort of you know end up shaping the track and the interesting thing is uh, minor changes to a very early stage of the generation can have a huge impact. So if I, for example, change the height of the terrain, if I make it just a bit steeper, then everything will be steeper and the pathfinder will start finding a completely different path because if it might, I if it dislikes a steepness or height, then it will start going more like, uh, like these curves uh, or if you make it flat, it will just go for, for a straight line. And because of that, the velocity prediction will also be different and because of that, the jumps that are placed will also be different. So just changing a minor valu value like very early on in the generation allows you to get very like wildly different results in uh, terms of levels. And we were really surprised by that as well. We were trying to design stunts and it's like, oh, this stunt is never appearing. Um, and then we, we lowered the steepness of the terrain a bit and then all of a sudden this jump was appearing. And it's like, hey, this is actually really interesting for players if they can choose what kind of terrain they want and they get different kinds of uh, challenges based on that. So it creates very different kind of, uh, of game design. But I think it's really a lot of fun to do because it, you're, you, you try to you know, teach this logic to a computer and, and sort of make it design levels for you. And once you, once you got it set up properly, uh, you know, like scattering some trees and some objects as well, you can create this really interesting lush environments that are different every time and it's all being done by the computer. Uh, so yeah, like I'm, I'm really hyped I'm about that, really proud about it. Um, and then for the sort of final part, I'd like to go a bit more into business slash marketing kind of stuff. Um, so um, keeping track of your hours is definitely a, a thing that people always sort of want to do and people always have a hard time doing, or at least that's what I uh, noticed. And the thing is, uh, the problem is that there's obviously like a million tools you can use to keep track of time, but it, is, it tends to be a separate tool, which is really hard because if there's a couple of people working in your team, then it's really hard to teach them to use these tools, right? And to, to sort of get people to, to automatically use these tools every day. So the thing is with us, like we use uh, Slack for team communication and this is the central point of communication. Like everybody, everything comes together in Slack. So my idea was like, well, what if I just use uh, webhooks to sign in and out through Slack? And this is what it's looked like. When I, when I come in in the morning, I just do start and then Timebot says, hey, good morning, a new work session started. Um, and then at the end of the day, when I'm done, it, I say uh, stop, and then I type what I, was, what I was working on. And then it just keeps track of your time in the background. Again, this is really uh, simple stuff, but the idea that you know, as an as as a owner of your company, you have to be smart about what you do, and software may be expensive, or you, know, you have to just be smart about it. And being a programmer allowed me to be like, hey, well, can't I use the you know, Slack API to, to sort of solve this? And the cool thing is what you get is you get this, this huge list of all kinds of stuff that you worked on, which is great for uh, post-mortem purposes. So you know, looking back, like, hey, how much time did I actually spend on these features? Or uh, you know, getting a more detailed overview of, of when you went to work and when you had your dips or what your monthly uh, totals are, what were your best months. So it just gives you so much more, uh, such a, you know, um, a better overview of how much time you're spending because it, um, the time you spend on a project tends to be very like floaty, like it's hard to know how much time you're actually spending and you could have this feeling like, oh, I feel like I'm working too much or I'm working too little. And this little tool allows you to, to sort of get a better insight in, in the actual time that you're spending. And another bonus feature that you get is because this is in, we have a, a separate channel to do these sort of start and stop commands. And because of that, you can see what people have been working on without, like for example, if I'm not at the office, like right now, I can go into uh, the timesheets channel. I can see what the, what the guys have been working on today, which is great, like it's a great way of, um, sort of showing each other what you've been working on. And this also really incentivizes people to use it because if it would just be you on your own, it's really easy to forget it. And this basically, you get these reminders constantly to, to that show like, oh, somebody signed in or signed out. So this really helps to make sure that everybody uses it. Um, so again, it's, super, it's a super simple tool, but it's really like, I love using it and I think it's super helpful. And it's these little things that you can do as a programmer where you, where if, if I wouldn't be a programmer, I would probably just 
be like, oh yeah, that's too bad, that's just the way it is. And as a programmer, you can be like, hey, but I can actually solve, it, uh, solve this. And the same goes for this thing I, I, I call a stream spy, not to be confused with Steam Spy. It's like it, I gave it a terrible name, but I think it's very, uh, it, it says what it does very well. So, because the thing is, nowadays, YouTube videos and Twitch streamers are a huge deal for you as a game developer for your uh, marketing purposes. So, to keep track of who's streaming your game or who's playing your game is very important. And I like, I'd like to say that for Action Hank, um, three quarters of all the sales that we made were at the direct result of a YouTuber or streamer playing the game. So that's like pretty serious stuff, especially as a small studio where you, can, you can't afford expensive uh, marketing campaigns. You have to be, again, you have to be smart, right? So, but this thing is, this, this whole YouTube thing is, is all, it's fairly new. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's definitely out there now, but there's still a lot of uncharted territory and people are still figuring out what to do and what tends to happen is that it's just this this guy and he's just making videos and then all of a sudden he's huge and, and famous and everybody's trying to reach him and so it's really the the sort of the communication channels haven't really been set up properly like it's it's a very new system so the thing here is like how do you keep track of people streaming your game because the stream is live and then it goes away and you know when they stop streaming and then it's sort of gone and it's not you can usually look back at the, the the streams but in order to keep track of who's streaming your game you'd have to be refreshing the twitch page every day and just sort of see what's uh, what's going on so again the programmer in me was like hey i can maybe write a tool for that and i found out that twitch has a very nice accessible api that you can query so you can ask for um, streamers for certain games so what I made is uh, this thing called a stream spy, and what the, what the idea basically is, so in the dashboard, you select a couple of games that you'd like to follow. So obviously I want to know when someone's streaming Action Hank or uh, Descenders, but there's this other thing which you could do is say, well, what if I try to collect a bunch of streamers that play games that are similar to Action Hank? So for example, Trials Fusion or uh, Sonic. So what you can then do is try to collect a bunch of streamers that play these games and then reach out to them being like, hey, I see you play a lot of Sonic. Maybe you like this game, Action Hank. So that's one of the, the, the ways I'm trying to use this, uh, this system. So you, you give it a bunch of uh, games that you want it to follow. And what the, what the tool does, it just sort of starts querying the, uh, the API every 15 minutes or so. And then you get this nice list of data which basically says, hey, these are the people that played your games, these are the amount of viewers they had, this is how long they played it, this is the actual you know, games they played, so now it's just like all the games that I follow, but I can also put it to you know, only Action Hank. So this is for the last year, the, the, the biggest streamers that, that played uh, Action Hank, and there was one guy who went to this uh, Games Done Quick speedrunning marathon, if uh, maybe you know it. Now, well, that was pretty huge. Um, so you can see the people that are actually playing your game. And for example, what, what could happen is you wake up and there's this, this big um, spike in, in sales on the Steam uh, dashboard. And you're like, hey, where did, where did this come from? And without this tool, you would have no idea where it would come from. And you'd have to like, really dive and, and dig in deep to figure out who was actually streaming your game. Uh, and with this, you can see like, oh, oh, it was this big guy who played the game. And then maybe you can send him a tweet like, hey, that's cool. Thanks for playing our game. And so it's really like it's, it's a super valuable tool. And, and uh, for example, you can also sort by the total time played. So these are the people that streamed Action Hank for insane amounts of time. Like I, I don't understand how, but, uh, but it's really cool because you can also reach out to these people because you can be like, wow, dude, it's so cool that you streamed our game. Like maybe we can join one of your streams sometime or you send them a couple of Steam keys to hand out to their viewers. You can get in touch with this audience because it's usually just single people doing this stuff on their own. They are super hyped about developers reaching out to them. Uh, and then the final thing, linking back again to Slack, our central tool of communication is you can use the Slack API to send updates to Slack. So this is what happens when someone starts streaming the game. You get this little pop-up saying like, hey, this person started streaming your game. And um, you can see sort of the, f the followers they have. And, and when they're done, it also says how many viewers they had. So if you're just working and you see like a big streamer pop up here, 
you can react immediately. So it's basically like someone is just constantly refreshing the page and just letting you know like, oh, by the way, someone's streaming now. If you want to join the stream, this is your moment. Because in an hour or in, in a couple of hours, it's gone again. So being able to react on these things as a developer is, is huge because if a big streamer is playing your game and you're like, oh, damn, let's click it and you join the stream and then you go into the chat and you're like, hey, we're the developers of the game. Well, the streamers, they love that. I mean, imagine that, right? You're just a streamer playing this game and then the developer of the game shows up. It's like, hey, man, how's it going? And then we had so much fun with these streamers playing our game and then just, you know, having banter in the chat and maybe handing out some Steam keys or something. So this, this has been a huge tool for us. And it's funny because it's, it's all running on our, our little, you know, hosted server. So it's, it's all pretty, like, internal. And I, I'd love to sort of share this with everyone and make it open for everyone, but I don't have the time to, uh, to build that right now to, to sort of set that up. But whenever there's some issue with our server and it might be offline for a day or it might be offline for a while, it's so weird because I got so used to this tool that it just feels weird if it's not there. It's like, oh, yeah, no, I, there's no email. Like, you're like, what? Why is so it feels so normal that this, that this tool is available that it's just, it's such a weird thing when it's, when it's not there. So, so this has really been a huge thing for us and it's just a stand, it, it's part of our whole marketing uh, thing. So keeping track of streamers, trying to reach out to them, trying to reach out to streamers that play different games. Um, so again, this is one of those things where, you know, the programmer mindset can really make you solve these problems in such an interesting way, which um, I think marketing people, because this is definitely a marketing tool, and marketing people tend to be less technical. So uh, I think the chances of a marketing person coming up with something like this is just uh, smaller because they don't know about the the realistic possibilities, right? So, um, yeah, that was that was uh, the final story. So these are a, a couple of examples, and I hope that you can sort of feel a bit inspired by it to try something like this yourself. If you're a programmer, you have these really valuable skills, you know, problem-solving skills, and they're super valuable in such a broad way. So, yeah, make sure to think out outside the box like that. So if, if you... So try to not focus only on your programming test. There's so much more value that you can add outside of your, your actual programming test. So yeah, that was it. Thanks for listening.